Our DIG organization is the Associates for Biblical Research, and we have been working in the highlands of Israel now for four decades. Um, I finished up the last four seasons of excavation at Kerbet El Makader as the director of excavations there, taking over for Bryant Wood. And uh, then we launched our dig at Shiloh two years ago, and so season three will be this coming summer. So we've now accumulated enough evidence that we can begin to draw some tentative conclusions, and it's some really exciting stuff. Uh, Shiloh is big stuff. Um, this was Israel's first capital. Uh, so when Jerusalem was still a pagan city, people went to Shiloh to connect with God. I mean, Hannah and Elkanah and Joshua and Caleb and Eli and Samuel, I mean, these are the people who there with the same basic human questions that we have, which is, how do I connect with God? How do I repair my broken relationships with other people? And the sacrificial system at Shiloh enabled them to do both vertically and horizontally to restore relationships. So we want to make some faith application, but I'm going to stay pretty close to the script, at least until we get to the Q&A section. Well, my new favorite Bible verse is Jeremiah 7:12. go now to Shiloh. So let's go. <laughs> So let's imagine you're volunteers with me on the archaeological dig at Shiloh. Uh, breakfast is at 4 a.m., so you will have set your alarm clock for 3.45 or 3.30 or how long it takes you to get pretty in the morning so that you can be at breakfast somewhere between 4 and 4.15. Uh, the bus pulls out at 4.59. We do devotions on the way to Shiloh, which is about a 30 to 35 minute drive. No traffic in the morning, of course. And uh, when you arrive, this is what you see. The sun will be coming up at about uh, 5.35 as you're walking up the hill. Uh, it'll take us about 15 minutes to get our tools and so forth organized for the day. So by 6 a.m., your trowel's in the ground. You've already had a good breakfast. You're awake and you're ready to go. You can see here in a beautiful overview of the site. It's about six to six and a half acres inside the walled fortification. And um, although it's not a national park, it runs like a national park because the local community has adopted the, the tell. We have a security fence all the way around the site and the modern settlement, so we have no vandalism to deal with. Now, vandalism is a big problem in the Middle East with archaeological sites. We fought it for many years at our previous sites, but uh, at Shiloh, thank God, we don't have to deal with that, so we're able to really do very careful and slow uh, work that we need to do. So this is the view that you would see in the morning. This is part of our team from last year. As Tim mentioned, we have the largest archaeological team of any site digging in Israel and perhaps the entire Middle East. But uh, you can see part of our group, and we're, we're sitting and standing on the glacis, the earthen embankment that surrounds the site, and that ancient fortification wall. It was a, an Amorite infrastructure that the Israelites inherited, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But that's where we are congregated here on the northern slope. We see an interesting object from this last summer. This is an inkwell. Anytime we get a whole vessel, we get excited. And uh, we scraped the inside of this and we're having it tested so we know what the ink was actually composed of. I have found styluses also in regular first century houses. Styluses, inkwells, why do we care? We care because of the issue of literacy. The issue of literacy begins way, way back in the time of Moses when we would have people tell us Moses couldn't have possibly written the Pentateuch because he was illiterate. There was no alphabet with which to write it and so forth. Well, you'll see in the new Patterns of Evidence film that that's simply not true, but they carry that argument all the way through into New Testament times. People will tell you that Jesus was an illiterate Galilean peasant. Which is fine if he was, but is that really what the text says? There's, there's not, a, not a crime or a sin to be illiterate or to be a peasant. But the text just simply doesn't bear that out. We see in Luke chapter 4 that Jesus takes the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He publicly reads it, as was his custom. In other words, that's the claim of literacy. And then we know, of course, in John 7 of Jesus writing in the sand. So we've got reading and writing both going on. Does the material culture bear this out? And the answer is yes. We find writing material in everyday common first century homes. Let me give you an example. Josephus tells us that there was a wall, a partition on the Temple Mount 
in the days of Jesus. And that that partition had 24 signs on it, 12 in Latin and 12 in Greek, alternating. Two of them had been found archaeologically. So Josephus had his facts right on this. Uh, and it separated the court of the Gentiles. Gentiles can't go past this point. What does the sign say? Any Gentile who crosses this line will be responsible for his own death. So you mean to tell me that we're putting people to death because they're illiterate? So people can't read, but we're going to put up signs that if you cross this point, you're going to be put to death. It just doesn't hold up to scrutiny. In Ephesians 2, you read about a wall of separation that God has destroyed. I think that's the wall that's pictured there. These levels of sanctity that Gentiles can only go this far, women can only go this far, non-priests can go this far, high priests can go this far. This, this segregated society that Jesus came to destroy those walls. I think is a powerful lesson. You can see here what we would call a... Middle Bronze Age milk jug. I don't know why we call it a milk jug. We just do. Uh, maybe it looks like what the milkman would leave outside your door. Be, of course, be goat's milk. But um, when, when we've seen enough of these, then we can diagnostically date, even though the rim is broken off, which is the most important part. We can be very confident of the date of a vessel like this. You can see an, a lamp from the time of King David. In fact, this is what we would call an Iron Age 2A lamp, which is exactly the time of David. Now, why would that excite me? Did David say anything about lamps? Lights, Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What was David picturing? I don't even think David knew what a lamp would have looked like from 200 years earlier, okay? And he certainly didn't know what they looked like in the future. When he's picturing what God's Word is like, this is what he has in mind. In other words, it provides light. Now, in a house, that's not a problem. You set it on a ledge, you fill it with olive oil, you see where the wick goes at the end. It's, you can still see the char or the burn there. But what about if you want to go outside because your Word is a lamp to my path? How do you take that outside without the oil spilling, without the wick blowing out? I used to always wonder that until we discovered that they were using lanterns. <laughs> so they had lanterns and with shelves in them, so you could have several lamps within a lantern. So this then becomes a metaphor for the scriptures. A oh, lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Well, right next to that palm granite that we talked about is this scarab. Now, let me tell you what a scarab is. The Latin word scarabus means beetle. And it's because the Egyptians believed that the dung beetle pushed the sun across the sky every day. Of course, they're polytheistic. They worship many things. But to me, this is kind of a silly thing. Of all things to worship would be a dung beetle. But this is what they believe. I mean, the ancient Greeks, at least, they believe that Apollo hooked up his four horsemen and pulled the sun across the sky every day. There's some nobility to that. But uh, no, the humble dung beetle. So they're always in the shape of a beetle. We found four this last summer. So I decided to give them names. John, Paul, George, and Ringo. <laughs> the Beals. And... Uh, this is John. Uh, no, it's actually, he's got a much more august name. This is Tutmose III. He's the greatest of all the pharaohs, the most powerful. He conquered all of Canaan in about 1483, uh, left his, his mark everywhere. He's the big guy in the 18th dynasty. Tutmose III, you can see his cartouche, the oval right in the middle. So this is just about the size of a quarter the shape of a beetle, there's a, a hole that goes through the center, so it can be worn around the neck or even on a ring sometimes. But it's his impression, it's his royal seal. Now this matters because no previous pharaoh ever used that same iconography in that same order. No later pharaoh is ever going to use that same iconography in that same way. So this thing gives us absolute dating because uh, assuming that we have good dates in Assyria and good dates in Egypt then, we can cleanly date the stratification that we're in. And once we can do that, then that which is below it is older, that which is above it is younger, and then we can work out a 
chronology. So this is clearly 18th uh, dynasty. In my view, Tutmose the third would be the pharaoh of the oppression. His, uh, his successor, Amenhotep II, would be the pharaoh of the Exodus. Regardless of whether I'm correct about that, this is important because it's 18th dynasty. So when someone argues that the sites weren't occupied, nobody was at home at Jericho, for example, when Joshua and the Israelites were supposed to have arrived. So you can't trust the Bible. Did you know that they had the same scarab at Jericho? Did you know they had the same scarab at Mount Nebo, uh, uh, Mount Ebal? and the same scarab now at Shiloh. And in each of those three instances, guess what the glyptic scarab experts have to say about that? These are commemorative scarabs. Commemorative scarabs. Later peoples came along and they created these like trading cards, if you will. They're commemorative. Well, isn't that convenient? That when we get evidence that synchronizes with the biblical text, all of a sudden it's commemorative. And my response to that is, says who and based on what? So I'd like to know some evidence for that, not just because it's contradicting your anti-biblical paradigm. Now it's fitting very nicely. We've got carbon dates, we've got ceramic dates, we've got glyptic remains like scarabs that are all coming together, but it clearly must be uh, commemorative because we know no one was there at that time. Welcome to my world. Altogether, we found six scarabs in our first two seasons at uh, Shiloh, three of them from wet sifting. So let me tell you what we're doing that is revolutionizing archaeology. I worked for two years as a supervisor in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount Sifting Project, and I became a big believer in the power of wet sifting. So what we do when we wet sift is we take the dry sifted material, it's already been checked a second time in dry sifting. Normally now it would be tossed out. Instead of tossing it, we then dump it into a bag. We've got like a funnel and then it goes down through our aluminum funnel system into a colored bag, which is color coded for that square. Then it's tagged for the locusts and pale so we know exactly where it came from. Then that colored bag with the tag goes to our wet sifting station. It's then washed in the wet sifting station and a rock covered in dirt, you've seen thousands and thousands of them, it's washed and guess what, it wasn't a rock after all, it was a scarab. Three of our six scarabs would have been thrown away. We got them through wet sifting. Now that is phenomenal. That means that us and everybody else has been missing half the evidence up to this point. Half of the work we have done, we have missed the evidence from. We actually need to go back now to old dump piles. And we are, we are doing, we're the first ones to do this. We're actually going back to old dump piles and wet sifting them. And believe me, from what we found last year, they are full of important archaeological material. So when, we, when we're claiming, well, they excavated this site and they didn't find anything, well, I guess not if they're throwing away half the evidence. And so it's not just that we were doing it, everybody was doing this. I mean, we couldn't at Kirby Al Makata, we had no water, we couldn't wet sift. It was in the wild, wild west, but most sites do have water. I predict that in the next 10 years, no site will be excavating anywhere without water, without using wet sifting. It's that revolutionary. We now wet sift everything, and I have a big team, fortunately, and so I can do this. So there's careful excavation in the square. Sometimes we can even find these things like coins and scarabs in situ in the square. That's best. Then we can get exact elevations to where they came from. If not, then we get them in dry sifting and we still know exactly where the material came from. The new step is the wet sifting. And this is where our older volunteers are so helpful to us because maybe they don't want to be down in an archeological square, but on the level footing in the shade, they can help us with this incredibly important task of wet sifting. This scarab would not have been found without wet sifting. Tutmosis the third, or call him John if you want, uh, is an important piece of evidence for us because you take that, it's, you've got proof that people are living at Shiloh when the Bible says that they were, just like at Jericho, just like at Mount Ebal. Well, pottery is a, <laughs> 
important piece of evidence for us, and you've got to learn that pottery. So when once we learn the pottery, we can then date because pottery changes over time. Your great-grandmother's dishes are different from your dishes. Um, when we are taking pottery in one time period, the rims evert, then they evert, then they're straight up. The, ba the ring bases are more protruded at some times than others. We have burnishing in some periods. We have glazing in other periods. We have inclusions in the clay that are lime stone in one period, maybe they're bitumen in a different period. So there's a, a lot of different indicators. But once we learn that pottery, then we can date using it and we can go to then dozens of sites across Israel and Jordan, what we would call the Southern Levant. And we can say, okay, in their stratum at Megiddo or their stratum at Gezer or Lachish or wherever the site is, they labeled this as late bronze too. And now we have the exact same form and we're confident now in also labeling it as late bronze too. So we're comparing constantly uh, our ceramic typology. So this is uh, basically our Bronze Age pottery from Shiloh. And then this is Iron One. You can see the collard rim jar. We have one of these on exhibit. You'll see at University of Northwestern. We've got this jar and he's as big as I am. This is a big collard rim jar from the Iron Age. This is evidence of Israelites. You know, the storage rooms I was talking about earlier, at the lowest level, we have Canaanite pottery. You get above that, and now we have Israelite pottery. We have collared rim jars. It changes. That's exactly what we would expect, isn't it? God told them you're going to live in houses you didn't build. You're going to occupy cities you didn't construct. They have now inherited this infrastructure. Those bones that I was talking about, in the Amorite Canaanite level, our stratum 7 and 8, it's 4% pig bone. When you then move into the next stratum, it drops to 1% pig bone. Now that's a very significant shift in the material culture that has taken place. Their diet has changed for some reason. Now as a Bible reader, of course, you know that there's a prohibition against pork. Now maybe you're asking yourself like, but what's up with the 1%? You know, where's that coming from? Well, let me tell you how I awakened this morning. I was lying uh, at the Mahoney Mansion downstairs, <laughs> and I smelled bacon frying upstairs, and it was really cold. I mean, you understand, I'm from Texas. I had hair when I landed yesterday, okay? <laughs> it froze off. So I'm under the covers, and what do I smell bacon frying? That gets me out of bed. So some poor Israelite had been exposed to the same aroma, I'm afraid, and uh, backslid from time to time. <laughs> then this is the pottery from later in the Iron Age. Some of our drawings of our flints. We, you know, everything that is found, we, we draw it, we photograph it, we analyze it so that we can understand it every possible way that we can. Here are the three steps I was talking about. These young ladies are excavating in the square. Actually, they're posing, but supposed to be excavating in the square. And then they're dry sifting the material here. And then you can see the final phase, the wet sifting that's going on up at the top. To the far right, by the way, that's Frankie Snyder, a member of our dig staff. But she's now become famous for identifying the flooring from the Temple of Jesus' day, what's called as the Opus Sectili flooring. And so it's fascinating now. Another member of our staff, Pettit's Ruben has identified the roofing. We actually have roof beams from the second temple that are in existence, maybe even been from the first temple. Uh, so now we've got floors and ceilings. And we're reconstructing that world of the Bible. Now, folks, ultimately, if the Bible is true, then the God of the Bible holds a moral claim on our lives. That is not a message that the entire world is eager to embrace. When you read my book, The Travel and the Truth, and you see, see synchronism after synchronism after synchronism, the Bible says it. Here's the confirmation of it. A fair-minded person will, I believe, conclude that there is a God of the Bible. <laughs>